Kia ora koutou and uh, Nissan Bulvinaka. Welcome to uh, our webinar today for Digital Pacific Live. Uh, my name is Tim Kong. I'm the program manager of the Pacific Virtual Museum. Uh, and my role today is to be your host and then just to help administer um, uh, some of the chats and questions and things. It's lovely to see a few of you joining us in Zoom in the Zoom session uh, and also people who are joining us or watching in uh, Facebook as well. Um, I am going to hand over to Tapatu, who will take uh, most of the responsibility of leading this fantastic session. Uh, and it's also wonderful to have um, Catherine here. Uh, and I'll hand over to you to introduce. Where we go. Thanks, Tapatu. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Tapatu, and I'm the engagement manager for the Pacific Virtual Museum Pilot Project. Um, one of the um, projects that we're doing is is showcasing our Digital Pacific website where you can find um, collections from the Pacific but also Pitkin Islands. Um, so today we will be hosting Catherine who's um, located at the, uh, the Pitkin Island Study Centre and will be showing uh, some of the collections that they have there. Um, talking about some of the stories um, and then afterwards I'll be showing you some of the digital collections that you can find on Digital Pacific. Um, so yeah, that's what our session is going to be like today. Um, I'll hand it over to Catherine to introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Catherine Van Arsdale and I have the privilege of being the archivist and special collections librarian at Pacific Union College, where we house, where we house the Pitcairn Islands Study Center, which is a study collection and a museum that is open to anybody from around the world who'd like to visit. And we have a little bit of an online presence thanks to Digital Pacific. And uh, we have a wonderful museum on our campus. So I'm looking forward to showing you some of the things today that you can find one way or another. So yeah, let's go ahead and we'll walk into the study center itself. And I just want to introduce you really quickly to our student who works for us. This is Emily. She's making updates to the Study Center website right now. So for many of you, you're going to see her handiwork. And this is the museum that we will be uh, walking around today, introducing you to some of our collections. Um, I could tell you a little bit about how our Study Center was established because you may be asking yourself, why does a college in Northern California have such a beautiful museum dedicated to uh, the Pitcairn Islands and what the connection is there? So Taputo, should I tell that story? Yeah. Okay, great. So, well, there's a little bit of a connection between our college and the people of Pitcairn Island. And that connection comes through the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In 1890, the Seventh-day Adventists had heard about the people on Pitcairn Island who were mostly members of the Church of England at the time. They were um, really excited about these people on this island and the faith that they had. They sent them some literature. The people on the island thought the literature was all right and they liked it. And so in 1890, the Seventh-day Adventists in California pooled their money and got more from around the world and built a missionary ship, which they named the Pitcairn. They sent this missionary ship to Pitcairn Island, along with a pastor and some uh, teachers and supplies. And they started this long relationship with the people of Pitcairn Island at that time. Um, many, if not all of the people on the island became Seventh-day Adventists then, and there's still a Seventh-day Adventist church there. So, uh, since the ship went out of the port of Oakland, there were some people from our school in 1890 who were involved with the fundraising or who were present when the ship was launched. So there's this long connection there. We also have a connection with one of the early school teachers on the island. Her name was Hadley Andre. And after she taught at Pit, on Pitcairn, she came to Pacific Union College and worked. So we have a little bit of a back and forth. So with that historical context, this collection was actually started in 1977, and it was founded by our director, Herb Ford. He is with us today on Zoom. Thank you for joining us, Herb. And he was a journalism teacher here at Pacific Union College in 1977, had an interest in the history of the mutiny on the bounty and of Pitcairn Island, partly because of that connection with the religious history of the Adventists on the island and here. 
And he was discovering that sometimes there were uh, news articles that just didn't have correct information about the people on the island or their lives or their history. And he wanted to put together a study collection that would be accessible by anyone and everyone so that they could be accurate and informed. And so he began to collect and is still collecting today. So that is one person that we have to thank for the Pitcairn Island Study Center and his name is on our door. <laughs> So, yeah, I can walk you through a little. Hmm. So the things that people come to see here, obviously we have this beautiful museum. Um, right now I'm introducing you to a set, of, um, a set of busts that were made by an artist. They depict the mutineers on the bounty and also some important people from Pitt Karen history, such as Rosalind Amelia Young, who wrote, who grew up on the island and wrote a book about her life growing up there, or Thursday October Christian, the son of Fletcher Christian, the first mate on the bounty, who is credited with starting the mutiny. And let's see here, I know I can find Captain James Cook as well, another famous uh, explorer of the Pacific, and William Bly, who was set a set um, off the ship and navigated his way to safety over thousands of miles after the mutiny took place. So obviously a lot of the history that we have starts there. Um, and we have a lot of collections that uh, have the background history of that story of the mutiny, the story of Pitcairn Island, the story of Norfolk Island where many Pitcairners moved in the mid 1800s. And those collections, many documents, letters, newsletters, photographs are held in these filing cabinets. So if you're a researcher on any of those topics, this is a wonderful place to come. Awesome. Um, so are those some model ships up on the, on the shelf there? Yes, absolutely. So the history of Pitcairn Island wouldn't be possible without a great many ships, um, starting obviously with the bounty, which brought the mutineers. Uh, people had lived on Pitcairn Island previously, people of Polynesian descent, but at the time that the mutineers arrived at the end of the 1700s, no one was living on the island at the time. But the connection with the outside world that the Pitcairn Island people have, uh, have maintained for now hundreds of years is due to the ships that come. And so we have a lot of model ships that highlight that important connection, different ships uh, representing different parts of that story. So I've shown you the model of the bounty. We also have a model of a Pitcairn Island longboat of the 20th century, the sort of boat that could make its way out of Bounty Bay, which is very dangerous and hard to navigate, and two visiting ships where supplies could be picked up or where islanders could sell their handcrafts to uh, bolster their economy. I also have the uh, model of the Pitcairn uh, uh, missionary ship. So highlighting that history with Pacific Union College and the Adventist Church. And a couple other really important ships. We have the Pandora, which came looking for mutineers, found a few of them, and then uh, was crashed on the Great Barrier Reef on its way to Australia. That wreck has since been found. And one of our most recent uh, models is the Australia Star, an example of the sort of ship that has brought supplies to Pitcairn and kept the people on the island um, fully stocked with whatever they need, maintaining that connection with the outside world so that they could continue their economy and to uh, provide for themselves. Wow. So a lot of ships, um, <laughs> some, of them, some of them replicas of the bounty. Yeah. yeah. And it looks like um, some of the handicrafts. Um, yeah. Exactly. So uh, a great many of the items we have in the in this display are examples of the sort of craftsmanship that the people of Pitcairn Island uh, perfect and then will sell to passersby or even some on the internet. Uh, if you go looking, I'm sure you can find. Uh, these, many of these are uh, carvings made out of Miro wood and they're very beautifully done. Um, many of the 
of the carvings that we have at the study center will have the artist's name etched on them somewhere. And that's always really nice to know who made this sea turtle, for example. Um, is there any effort to get these like um, pictures of them and get them digitized? That is something we would love to do. And we have started by digitizing uh, 2D objects, which is a little easier. So we've started with our photographs and our postcards, and we would like to move from there to some of our documents. For example, something that is next on our list is the Pitcairn, um, uh, how do you say this word? Uh, Messalini? <laughs> Miscellany? <laughs> it's a word I've never been able to say. But this is the island newspaper, and we have a complete run of it, which begins in 1959 and carries through to the present. So it records the history of the island as written by people living on Pitcairn Island. And that's really a lot easier to uh, digitize, but we certainly want to continue to add that full story and would love to include um, carvings and basketry and other artwork eventually. Awesome. Oh, I thought you and I had, yeah, <laughs> you and I had talked about this a little bit. This is yeah. according to the, the caption we have, a Polynesian festival skirt made on Pitcairn Island. And you and I had talked a little bit about that connection with uh, the greater Polynesian culture and how interesting that was to see. So yeah. I wanted to especially highlight it for our viewers. Yeah, it looks like, um, so does it say what it's made out of? I wonder how, if the same fibers um, were from the, you know, they might have bought like um, the same plants and things to make these crafts over to Pitkin. Maybe. That's a really great question. <laughs> um, I don't know what it's made out of. Our director, yeah. Herb Ford, might know. He's on the call. We may hear from him. Uh, <laughs> and if not, that's certainly something that uh, perhaps someone who's watching will recognize this fiber and they could identify it for us. Or you could follow up with us later and we can do a little research and find out. But I think that you're, you're right on the money. They yeah. certainly had some uh, some of those plants that had already been brought to Pitcairn Island. I know there were some breadfruit trees that were growing on the island, I think when the mutineers arrived that had been brought previously by Polynesian explorers. So it's possible that some of those native plants, those, those recognizable things uh, yeah. are, are what we're seeing integrated into the art and the handicrafts, uh -huh. such as these baskets. Yeah. Um... Later on, I'll be showing some of the collections that are some, similar to these baskets that are um, from the Austral Islands. Whereas, yeah, and they look very similar and it looks like the same technique has been used and the same fibers, which shows quite a good connection between Pitkin and yeah. the Austral Islands. Absolutely. And, and one thing that comes to my mind, I've seen items like this that were purchased by someone and then and then they're on display in other places and you can see the reach of the Pitcairn Island or other island crafts. Um, yeah. I visited Jack London's home and he has uh, a fan that's sort of made in this style and mm -hmm. painted on it, it says Pitcairn Island. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, what fun. This uh, <laughs> famous author and his connection to Pitcairn, even he was interested in the crafts and the artwork. Yeah. Um, oh, what's on the wall there? So as we're kind of coming around this corner of the uh, museum, we're approaching uh, part of the story of Pitcairn Island that's quite important. So the island is known for its stamps. And that's part of the economy of Pitcairn Island that's really helped the people there and has become very uh, important worldwide. Uh, stamp collectors uh, really value and treasure the uh, first day covers and the stamps and the cancellations from Pitcairn Island. Um, they, they established their first post office, I believe it was in 1940, and they began to uh, be able to publish their own stamps at that time. And this display is a collection of sort of 
Uh, some facsimiles of representative stamps and cancellations on, uh, on envelopes that are in our collection. And we also have some of those uncanceled, um, uh, pristine versions of, of almost every stamp. You, you could ask uh, our director, Herb Ford, and he could give you a really good idea of how many stamps we have. But it's a wonderful representative collection of those stamps that have been made on Pitcairn Island and then circulated around the world. Wow. And many of these are addressed to the postmaster. It was the first postmaster on Pitcairn. He was a young man who was not born on Pitcairn, but his father brought him in 1909 when he was quite young. His name was Roy Clark. And we actually have a collection of uh, documents from Roy Clark. So we have letters that he wrote to and from people. Uh, he was a wonderful pen pal, in addition to being deeply involved with the stamps and with the communication to and from the island as his actual job. He seemed to love it as well. Okay. Some of that I can share with you later if you would be interested. Um, what are those? on that shelf there they are beautifully painted yeah so this is one of those pieces of art that i'd love to highlight you may be able to see them here i have a second display i'll show you in a second um, and these uh, pieces of art are another kind of underscoring of that little bit of a connection between Pitcairn Island and our school in northern california so these are paintings made by uh, primarily women on Pitcairn Island, um, sold to passersby on ships, and they are, um, they're called Hattie Leaves, because uh, Hattie Andre, who was that school teacher who taught on Pitcairn Island, and then came to Pacific Union College later, one of our dorms is named for her, uh, she was involved with some of that, the first paintings of these leaves as they were kind of trying out um, the way that they would like to do this particular form of art. And so they called them affectionately after her. I have a couple other examples to show on a dark background so you can get a better idea. Let's see. Oh, you can see the intricacy of the painting. Yeah. And on some of them, like for example, this one, the artist Betty Christian is identified. Oh, cool. That looks like similar like to Tapa kind of like the leaves. Uh, uh, you know, uh, let me ask you. So uh, it says it's the pandanus tree. Is that yeah. is yeah. that the same? Yeah. Oh, it that's did. fantastic. Yeah, okay. uh, I actually have a couple photographs I thought I might show you. Uh, one of them. Let's see. So these are uh, photographs from our collection. They are also digitized, and you can see them through Digital Pacific or our website. And these are people from Pitcairn Island in, I believe, the 1930s who are on board a passing ship selling some of those examples of the artwork we just saw. I believe here we have a hattie leaf and then a couple baskets, of course. Wow. So it's kind of neat to, to see in action. Yeah. And have these um, photographs been digitized as well? Yes, they've certainly been digitized. And I believe these have been uploaded. If they're not there yet, they will be. They have been digitized. Awesome. Yeah. Those baskets must be all around the world. I think we've got some. I think they must be. Yes. <laughs> Well, I have, I have some of our collections I could get into a little bit. And then I have um, our really exciting uh, kind of conclusion to the museum. So uh, what do you think would be best, Taputu? Would, would it be best if I show the last display and then we come back to a couple collections? Or would you like to, to see a couple collections now? Um, see a couple collections. Did, um, what's on that table that you've got it up there? Sure. So I talked a little bit about the importance of stamps. Mm. And so I wanted to show one of those set. So I'd shown the uh, examples of the facsimiles of uh, the canceled stamps on envelopes. But we also have many collections of the pristine collectible stamps. And the artwork on them is always just very fascinating to see. Mm. And you can see, of course, the, the baskets and the mural wood carvings are making their appearance in the stamps. 
So for those who are interested in the history of Pitcairn Island, not from the stamp perspective, but what was so important that they chose to put it on the stamps? There's an interesting question there too. And I have a couple images from our collection. Um, these are people waiting for the post office to open. <laughs> so I thought that would be quite interesting to see. Um, with the stamps, what years um, do they have on there? So in this particular binder, I'm seeing this is 1977. Mm. And I'll get a feel for how far it goes. Let's see, too far, there we go. Uh, here we have some from 1982. They have not been placed on the page, but they're here uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in honor of Princess you. Diana, He's Diana. Karen Island. <laughs> yeah. So you see the, the connection with, uh, with uh, Great Britain, yes. of course. Uh, we really had cool. Queen Elizabeth previously. Yeah. Let's see. And then uh, some other. So for someone who's interested in stamps, uh, mm -hmm. our collection in that direction is varied and uh, thorough. So there, there's plenty that could be said. I would love to, uh, I would love to see uh, someone come do research into the artistic decisions on the stamps from Pitcairn. I think that would be quite wonderful. Yeah. Um, and does it have even the price on it as well in those envelopes? I believe so. So here we have Christmas set 1982 would have cost $2.50 and you're getting probably two dollars and fifty cents worth of stamps so a good deal pretty fair yeah, yeah. So many stamps. yes many many stamps which we've <laughs> highlighted a few in a display that's right at the entrance of the study center which you may have been able to see as I came in but uh, um, if you missed it you come visit us <laughs> yeah. um, oh what's it on the table there <laughs> So this is uh, the first part of our collection of papers from Roy Clark. And I wanted to highlight him because he was that postmaster who wrote so much and two people around the world. And I wanted to read to you just a little snippet. He's writing in April 9, 1950 to a friend named John. And he says, plenty of potatoes here, tons of them, sweet <laughs> potatoes. Meat off and on most every day of the year. I eat very little meat. All milk is imported or obtained aboard the ships. Fowl run wild most all over the island. They do some damage to crops, but the people put up with this a good deal. The fowl are small and scraggy, a poor breed. Still, when shot beyond the village, beyond the village, they're fairly fat. <laughs> so <laughs> the, I, I just get a kick out of it. Um, the, the collections we have with the correspondence from people who live on the island, they really capture what the life is like. Yeah. And I, I wanted to also share a little bit from that uh, newspaper of Pitcairn Island that captures another slice of life as well. Just so you could see um, the story of the people as they tell it in their own words, coupled with the artwork that we have here, hopefully you can get a nice rounded view that will make you more intrigued about Pitcairn Island. Mm. So I'm going to show you this picture of band members as I read mm -hmm. from the newsletter. And this is the first issue of the newsletter ever in the column titled Village Chat. The Pitcairn band received great encouragement the other night. Why, at one stage there was an appreciative audience of four, all cheering and slapping after each item was rendered. What with Floyd's deep-throated burp, burp, and Oscar's tinny, I'm sorry, tenor horn, and an occasional blast from the trombone, poor old John ended up with itching ears. We felt it wiser not to ask the audience what their ears were like. And then, to cap it all off, Andrew calls from the window, window you're improving! That coming from... That coming from Andrew, who has to put up with the peculiar sounds next door every Sunday night, made every member go home full of courage. He must have recognized one piece at least. Is, the language that they use is so hilarious. <laughs> and, and I'm struck by the fact that it, it's just so wonderful. Uh, no one is mentioned with their last name. It's all first names because everyone knows each other in this community. Because <laughs> there's four people watching me and listening to me. <laughs> An a, a rousing audience of four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So these are the sorts of things that we're really excited to share with people when they come to visit, if they can't, would like to do some research, and the sorts of things we'd like to continue digitizing and making available. Mm. So um, I can show you our, uh, our very popular exhibit. That's one of the newer items that we have here at the study center. And there's a bit of a mystery associated with it. Mm. Well, let me get rid of this glare briefly. Now, I'm not sure if you can tell what this is. Any guesses? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like hair. Yes, of course, you are absolutely correct. <laughs> So this is a very interesting and somewhat startling exhibit that we have, and it, it includes this item that's somewhat recently acquired. Um, it's a set of pigtails that were acquired at Sotheby's by someone who donated them to us, uh, and they came in this, this can. And along with the can and the hair, there was a little note that said, these are pigtails from the Bounty Mutineers. And there's no way of knowing if that's true or not without doing some testing of some sort. And here at the study center, we don't have the skills or the equipment necessary for that. But our director, Herb Ford, wrote mm. a press release about the acquisition of these pigtails and the interesting mystery that they represent. And there was enough interest generated by just letting that news out there that two institutions have since uh, gathered samples from this hair and are doing genetic testing. And um, those places are King's College London and the FBI. So we are awaiting <laughs> some professional feedback and they'll be able to test the DNA of this hair, even though it's quite old, they hope that if they have enough, they will be able to pull DNA and then they mm -hmm. can test along the mother's line. You can match DNA and with people who live on Pitcairn Island now, they might be able to determine if these are authentic. Mm -hmm. And even if they aren't, the fact that they've been saved and that they were described as mutineers pigtails, to us, it's always interesting because it's part of that story of the, almost the mythos and the excitement that surrounds the story of the mutineers and the people of the island. Huh. Um, how many pigtails are there? So I believe there should be nine, but one of them's broken. So I think we have 10 pieces here and you can see there's one that's, that's been uh, loose. Yeah. Yeah, but, and you and I had talked about the slight differences in hair color. Yeah. It's very, very slight. It's sort of surprising how similar they all are. <laughs> yeah. I want, yeah, I think I asked the question if they, this, the color of the hair uh, matches like early paintings or pictures of mutineers, see if they align. And I think that that is a wonderful, a wonderful thing to uh, pursue. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to do it yet, but I can very easily imagine an interesting research paper that someone may write, um, whether it's about the story with, with the finished part, do, will we know from King's College London or will we know from the FBI whether these are genetically proven to be the hair of mutineers from the bounty? Well, even if we don't know. How what old, an interesting it, thing to collect. And yeah, it doesn't how have a old, book authentic. Like how old would those like pigtails be? Are they pretty, in a pretty good condition? Well. That's a great question. So they would have probably been cut at some point in the early 1790s. You'll have to forgive my memory. Um, not great. I know that many of the mutineers who settled on Pitcairn Island died in a big dispute and only two of them survived afterward. Um, and then one of them passed away of, I believe, asthma and John Adams was the last surviving mutineer. And so it would have had to have been very quickly in those first years that they had landed on Pitcairn Island and were beginning to establish their home, that, that all of that hair could have been gathered at once. So there's a brief window. So, uh, you, I don't know if you know this question, but um, do they cut the hair when they pass away or when they like land on a new like island? Oh, that's a great question. You know, um, 
<laughs> I don't know yeah. for sure. My, yeah. my best educated guess, I know that in the Victorian era, which comes much later, um, mm -hmm. people would in, in uh, English society and in uh, Western society, I know they did it in the United States, um, they would gather hair after people had died and sometimes create commemorative items. So it's possible that there was some, some precursor of that in the culture. But yeah. it could have been something else entirely that I don't know that that inspired them to do that, if indeed they yeah. did. That's a good um, way to figure out, like having these hair pieces is awesome to see you know, <laughs> the history and where they came from. So I'm glad that you guys have it and there is going to be some research into it. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you. Yes, we're excited. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think you've given us the whole tour of the museum so far, haven't you? But there's so much more to explore if you go in person. Um, I think we'll go into our next part where I can show and demonstrate some of the digital collections that um, we used to have um, on our website. So I'll just um, give you an introduction about our website. Um, which is called Digital Pacific, Pacific spelled P-A-S-I-F-I-K, um, which is the top person um, spelling for the website. Um, I'll just share my screen. So this is, can you see, can anyone see that? Whoops. I can see it. Okay, so, so this is our Digital Pacific website. So, um, it's part of a project that me and Tim are working on called the Pacific Virtual Museum pilot project, which is funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia, but implemented by the National Library of New Zealand and the National Library of Australia. So the aim of this website is to make accessible Pacific collections. Um, that are online and digitized and making it accessible for Pacific people to discover. And maybe they don't know that these are even exist. So what um, this website is, well, while it, what it isn't is a repository. So we don't hold any of these collections. We simply direct our viewers to um, our content partners who have these collections. Um, so this website was launched in November last year. And so we worked with a co-design uh, group with representatives from the Pacific and also um, New Zealand, Australia and the US, mostly in the glam sector to help us um, develop the site and also <clears throat> um, help us design and, and teach us about how it should function for our people. Um, so one of the first things that we wanted to do is make sure that Pacific people can access this website. So it works on low bandwidths, um, and so it works on really well on 2G and 4, uh, 3G networks. So that means it won't chew up all your data if you're in the Pacific. We know that data is really expensive, um, and we want to make sure that you can access these collections. Um, um, so what I'll just walk through the website so you'll be greeted with a Pacific greeting at the moment here in New Zealand it's New Way and Language Week. Um, we made this website really easy to use so many of our, um, our visitors may not be researchers or from the museum kind of sector so we wanted to make sure that they'll be easily accessible to use. Um, so you can either um, explore some of our collections by media type, image, object, video, audio, text or maps. Also you can um, explore through our content partners, which we've got um, many at the moment, heaps at the moment. We've got some US um, um, content partners that we've just got in yesterday. So the Smithsonian Institution, um, some from New Zealand, which is Te Papa, and we've also got Pitkin Island Study Centre at Pacific Union College, which we were really excited to get in uh, last year. Um, um, one of the other really cool features of our website is that 
you can explore by location or country. So when you hover over the location name, you can also get the outline of the island or country, which is really cool what our designer did. Um, and so if you want to find Pitkin Islands um, collection, just click on the location page here. And then you'll be greeted with um, a greeting from Pitkins, but it also shows you how many records that you can see on the website, which is 891. You can also explore by media type. You've got 860 images, but also you can see collections from other content partners. And some of them are right here. But what I wanted to show is some of the objects that you can find. Um, there was a painted shell. This one here. So this collection is from Te Papa Tongarewa. And as Catherine was um, showing the hattie leaves, it looks like they've done kind of the same designs on shells, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and then you can find more information if you click on it, and that will take you to Te, Papa, Te Papa Tongarewa. So this looks like it's from Mrs. Mimi Warren um, from the Pitkin Islands. Classification is a souvenir. Um, it looks like it's on a oyster shell. Um, and yeah, so I thought that kind of had a good connection between the hattie leaves and the artistry that was used on the shells, similar to the one that was used on the hattie leaves. Um, and if we go back, you want to see more collections. If we go back, you can also have a look at Pitkin Island Study Centre's collections, or else you can go onto the content partner page, which is just here. So this kind of shows you where they're located, a little bit of a background of um, the museum and their artifacts but it also has a link to their website, but also a email that you can also contact them. And then we have some beautiful pictures from the 1910 of Pitkin Island that you can explore. So I think we have 787 um, of the collections from PUC. That you can have a look at. Um, one of the images that I wanted to highlight was actually this one here. Quickly make it a bit bigger. I thought this was an awesome image. And it also has, so the bounty anchor in 1969. So I'll just read out the description of it. The bounty anchor cast overboard by Fletcher Christian and his eight fellow mutineers in nine. 1719 was recovered in 1957 and today is set up in the public square on Pitkin Island. Fred Christian on the left um, and Park and Christian right, both 85 years old, are great great grandsons of Fletcher Christian and the closest living link to Pitkin to the Bounty Mutineers. Um, and these were from a set of postcards made by Dexter Press in 1969. Um, yeah, I thought that was a really cool image and it has quite a lot of information attached to it as well. Um, I wanted to also show some of the connection um, with French Polynesia and where some of the descendants from Pitkin Islands came from. Um, on our website, we also have a country or archipelago page from the descendants from, oh, from Oshawa Islands that I wanted to show. Um, yeah, so this is the page here, greeting, um, these are from the Oshawa Islands to her, her pie, um, we've got 1,226 records from the Oshawa Islands, um, and I wanted to show quite a lot of things from the Smithsonian, I think most of their records are um, plant types. Also fish as well, <laughs> fish collections. 
but I kind of wanted to show an object that I found um, from Tupapa. So these are some of their um, petals. We've got a dish there, kind of a very intricate looking basket. Lots more petals. On to the second page here. Another bowl, which kind of looks similar to the handicrafts that um, Pitkin Island Study Centre have. Trying to find this basket. Um, which looks like this. <laughs> so this is, this looks kind of similar to the baskets at um, the study centre. So here's some information about um, what it is, which is an ete woven pandanus bag. The ete is woven in Czech from a fara paore processed pandanus strips, natural in colour into a rectangular cuboid shape with dark brown overlaid ete mea banana fibre strips, forming a pattern of two wide horizontal bands around the sides of the form. Two twisted cards, cords are attached to the top for the ite for carrying an additional woven band of natural pandanus leaflets is attached along the sides of the rim. So I thought there's some more, if you click on that, you can also go into Auckland Museum's um, catalog, a bit more information and you've also got a few more images of the, the bag, the basket. So I thought it was kind of cool to see the connection that um, the Austral Islands have with Pitkin Islands. So some of the people that may have left um, the Australs kept on um, creating these baskets while they were there. Um, I also wanted to show another image from which of the postcard collection. I'll just make it bigger. And these are also from the study center as well. Um, sorry, but I'll just make that a little bit smaller. Um, I just thought this image was really cool. It seems to show um, maybe a few generations in one image. So it looks like the great great grandmother, maybe the parents of the baby and their parents there. Um, but not much, oops, sorry, not much is known about the image um, from PUC. So I thought this was a great opportunity if you're from the Pitkins or if you know um, people maybe in this image as well. Um, we've got a feature on our website where you can um, um, share some of your knowledge with it. I think this looks like a gift from the collection of Morris Allard. And then it also has maybe the address on there as well. So if anyone is connected with Morris or knows anything about the image, um, I'm just going to show you a feature that you could use. So at, um, from all the collections on our website, um, we've got a feature down the bottom to contribute your story. So it's just a little form that you can use um, to contribute. So the share your feature, so you can put your name in. Um, you can choose whether your name to be displayed or displayed as anonymous. Um, we also would like your email. So it's not going to be displayed on the website, but it, that's just a way that we can contact you if you would like to share more information with us. Um, we've also got this um, another bit that you can you can refuse for us to contact you further about the the story that you've got, or else you can agree, and then we can possibly connect you with. Uh, the study center to see if they would like more information. Another area you have to fill out is the place. So this could be the place where you are now or the place that your story is set. Um, then you would write a title for your story and also a description of your story as well here. And then you'll click next. And so you'll get a review. So I'll give you an option to 
um, get us anything that you like of your story and then a thank you from us for sharing your story as well. Um, once you've submitted it, it will go straight to our user contributions page as well. So that will be, we've got 18 shared so far. And these are from uh, people from around the Pacific sharing stories about items on our, on our collections here. Um, I'll just read out some of them here. Um, so your stories don't have to be, it could be memories, it could be emotions that you felt, you could have been to the place. So I'll just read out this one here. So this one is in a church in uh, Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. So this one, I'll just click on it. So when you click on the item, you also get a description from where the object is, which is from Te Papa, and it will give you a description of what they have on it, the information they have. But with user contributions, it's, it's shown separate um, in a different box as well. So this one is about my first time on Rarotonga was when I was 16 years old for our family reunion. On the last day of the reunion, we went to this church. I remember sitting in the same spot where this photo was taken. Watching and listening to the congregation sing beautiful Imene Toki. After church, my mum showed me and my sisters a grave outside, which she said was my grandmother, her mother, who had passed away before I was born. I think, so this actually is a story from me. <laughs> I just wrote as a guest. Um, but it kind of just gives a bit more emotion to the image. Um, so from to Papa's um, description, it just shows it's a congregation inside the church, but with more people adding more story and more depth to the story or to the image, it kind of brings it back to life. And so this is an opportunity for people to share their knowledge. Um, at the moment, we've only got information from um, our institutions and our content partners, but this is an opportunity for Pacific people, or people that have been to the areas, these areas to share a little bit a bit of their story and their history about it. So yeah, so I thought this was a really good opportunity to share. If anybody knows anything about these people in the picture, when it was taken, who they are, you may be descendants from them. It's an opportunity to share your story um, because at the moment we don't know who they are and like um, institutions would love to know and love to update this information about them. Yeah, so that was kind of um, an opportunity for people to share. So yeah, um, I think we've got about 10 minutes left and I was just saying if anybody has any questions that um, for either me or Catherine. Uh, no one's asked any as we've gone through. Everyone's been avidly listening <laughs> and paying attention, I'm sure. But um, And I haven't seen any on Facebook either. So, um, okay. yeah, again, there's about seven or eight people watching on Facebook, which is nice. Kia ora to you. Sorry, I'm looking up there and I should be looking here. Kia ora to you. Uh, question from Patrick. Uh, can we rewatch again later? Absolutely. Um, the Facebook Live post will be there so if you're on Facebook you can watch it but we record all our sessions um, and then late at night I edit up with a little bit of branding at either end uh, adjust any sound and post it to our YouTube channel um, as well um, so yeah absolutely mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a question come up here. Oh, sorry, one for you, Catherine. Uh, who can donate items to the Pitcairn Island Study Centre? Oh, anyone who would like to talk to us about a donation, we are always happy to hear from you. Uh, it, it just reach out to us at pitcairn at puc.edu. You can find our contact information on that Digital Pacific Partner page, or you can go to our website, pitcairnstudycenter.org. But yeah, just start a conversation with us. We always want to talk to anybody who's interested and wants to support the collection. Fantastic. It's great to hear. Um, and just, yeah, a bit of props for you from Patrick. Um, I 
I think you can read that, Catherine. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, oh, another question coming up from Vivian. Uh, or oh, comment, I'm not sure. But anyway, I got to see the rudder of the bounty at the Fiji Museum a few years ago. Are there any remnants of the ship uh, manifests and things like that that exist at your collection or um, elsewhere that you're aware of? Oh, certainly. So there, there are pieces of the ship in a lot of places. We do have a few. So for example, these are some pieces of metalwork salvaged from the wreck of the bounty, some nails and pieces of the hull, and uh, we also have um, a, what looks like a piece of a cannonball from one of the six swivel guns on the bounty. And we have a few other items that are like this. I just happen to be standing in front of this display case right now. Thought I'd show you that. Mm -hmm. and, and of course there are other uh, locations around the Pacific that also hold pieces of the bounty. Um, it's been a wonderful collector's item for many people over the years. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and I think, yeah, I've just, and as Suliana's just said, thank you um, for your tour. I really enjoyed that as well. I think um, I was just reflecting on how our version or vision of uh, what the PUC Pitkin Island Study Centre is, has basically been only what we've pulled through in metadata uh, and the, the postcard collection. So it's wonderful to see, um, you know, the physical space and to see the items uh, that are there and, and how they're how they're hosted um, and, and presented. So. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, some, uh, is there anything on Facebook before we go? Just want to make sure because somebody just texted me oh, really? and said, yeah. I have a question. Oh, yeah, we've got two questions on Facebook. Okay. Great. I think this one is for Tim. How hard was it to get permissions from content partners? How best to gather those kind of permissions? Um. Yeah, it's been interesting. In, in our case, I think Catherine approached us. <laughs> so we were very lucky uh, in terms of this collection. Uh, we we seek to just reach out via often via sort of um, as we're looking and that's mostly in your your space tops, but um, we basically mm -hmm. seek to reach out and build a relationship with agencies or institutions. Um, Again, our the only item we only show items that are digitized uh, and that are public on publicly accessible websites. So um, we're not looking for records or catalogs that are behind either paywalls or, or um, you know, require have restrictions permissions on them at all. Um, we're basically only showing what one can find already on the web and can and view as as a member of the public. Um, but we also uh, and so there's a lot of those aggregators, uh, which are open content. But we also very much uh, lean into a, a relational engagement with our content partners. We want to shine a light on the work of our content partners as well as the work of or the opportunity for people um, and you know you've shown it really well today Tups of just asking questions of things that you've never seen before <laughs> I think that's the magic sweet spot of uh, actually finding out about things that we didn't know existed um, mm -hmm. and, yeah, grateful to in, in today's one Catherine sharing sharing what you hold there in, in Northern California it's really exciting um, cool um, we've got one more question um, how many island stamps are in the various collections represented in the islands website? Oh, that might be for me. <laughs> how many how many stamps are in your collection that you know of first? Um, so this is a question about the Pitcairn stamps. Yeah. How many stamps are in the collection? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know. It is significant. I I'll just show you very briefly one section of our collections. Uh, these binders all contain stamps and we have two full uh, shelves full of them. And that's just a portion of the stamp collection. So um, it's uh, certainly something that is ready for researchers to dive in. And we're a very small space, really beautifully put together and well loved. But it means that we work very slowly over time and, and learn things as we go. And that's something we'll find out someday, just how many stamps we have. <laughs> So somebody needs to do a research project and come to your venue and have a look at them and count them for us, for you. <laughs> yes, yes, please. <laughs> um, I've just got uh, Mr. Ford putting his hand up. So um, I'm actually- oh, wonderful. Gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna yes, turn- Yes, please, 
Uh, Mr. Ford, I'm just going to turn mm -hmm. your uh, microphone on so that you can talk. Uh, we won't be able to see you, but we'll be able to, to listen to you. So you can, uh, should be able to talk now if you unmute. Um, are you right to unmute your, your microphone there and then we can hear you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can can you hear me? Yes. We can. Yes. Yep. Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> I just want everyone to know my great appreciation to uh, your organization for including uh, the Pitcairn Island Study Center as a resource. Um, it uh, was not shown in the tour very much here, but uh, there's a, a whole line of uh, vertical files that are along one wall of our study center that have perhaps 50,000 or more pages of information that have come from every place in the world and enriches the uh, subject matter that a person might be interested in. And also we didn't see much of the uh, books of the collection itself of uh, perhaps uh, 12 to 1500 uh, books that specialize right on Pitcairn Island and uh, the bounty story. So I, I was just wanted to make sure that those were known in, in the, uh, in the show and I really appreciate so much uh, all that uh, Ms. Van Arsdale has done for the study center. I have gone into semi-retirement at least and she has done a wonderful job. So uh, we're here or there and uh, invite anyone and everyone to gain a bit more knowledge about this very small but very famous island and its story uh, about uh, uh, the mutiny on the bounty. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Herb. Thanks for joining us and sharing some of your, all the hard work that you've done for um, the people of the Pitkins, but also people that are interested in the Pitkin Islands too. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Ford, for that, uh, all the work you did previously, um, but also, uh, as, as you just said, thank you to Catherine for all the work in, in maintaining and managing that. Um, and I just started to say earlier, but um, as interrupted, Catherine, I just really appreciated how, how natural you were in showing it around. I appreciate that sometimes librarians who work uh, just with content, uh, it's, it's a big jump to step into this space, which is essentially being a a host of a TV show for, for an hour. You did a fantastic job of um, showing the items, presenting the items and all the, the work that's gone into it. So we're grateful for um, not just being a part of Digital Pacific. Um, as I said, you reached out to us. So it was great to have you on board, but also the work that you've done there at PUC. Um, and we look forward to as digitization increases for PUC and that the Pitkin Island Study Center sharing more of that through our site. Thank you. We look forward to it too. Um, oh, there's one con and I'm just repeating what I said, but one from um, Jose there. These items are so cool. Always good to gain more knowledge uh, and more insight. Um, and Charlotte from Facebook also said, Great tour. Thanks, everybody. Charlotte and <laughs> <Lenaz there. laughs> Choice. All good. Well, um, we are bang on 11 o'clock. Uh, so what we might do is um, just wrap up. Uh, and I'll just do that by um, just acknowledging Catherine and Mr. Ford and the staff and the teams at PUC. And, and thank you so much for welcoming us into your space for this hour uh, and sharing um, <clears throat> the records. Uh, and thank you to Tapatu for the hosting. I know a lot of prep goes into uh, that, you know, preparing for your live demo of the site and having all the records. Um, so appreciate all that work. Um, as always, uh, you can, uh, as Catherine said, uh, via Digital Pacific, you, there are the contact details for PUC and the Pitkin Island Study Centre, um, and is on that site. Um, we are also there 
as said at the start, this is on Facebook, Digital Pacific on Facebook, uh, and we're on Twitter as well. Uh, and these will go up on a, this recording will go up on a YouTube channel. Um, so thank you everyone for your time. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or evening or morning, wherever you are. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar, which interestingly enough is tomorrow. Do you want to pitch that, Tubbs? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so tomorrow uh, we're going to be talking with the Longo Nui, Nui um, and also Sheena, who are, are lyricists that are promoting um, the Nui language through music and song. So, yeah, join in to our webinar tomorrow, which is at 12 to 1 New Zealand time. Thanks, everybody. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Kakitiano. Excellent. Kia ora koutou uh, and Nissan Bulvanaka and welcome to everyone who's joining us in uh, Zoom. And I'll forget my studio piece, I'll turn the lights on so I look like I'm a real television personality. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I'll start that again, shall I? And... <laughs>